I'm Aaron Bobrostrain. I'm a professor of politics here at Whitman. I teach courses on immigration policy and the U.S.-Mexico border, as well as global environmental and food politics. Hi all, I'm in my backyard this morning trying to figure out how to recreate the feeling of community and connection from my face-to-face -face classes as we go fully online next week. It's a big challenge, uh, but making sure that those classes stay relevant in the middle of this current crisis won't be that difficult. Today I've been out here thinking about my course, Introduction to Global Migration. It's a first year class. It's also a class that any student can take um, as preparation to participate in the US-Mexico uh, US border summer field school that I offer some summers. Um, right now, that program's in the planning stages to run the next time in the summer of 2021, and I'm really excited about it. We are gonna start in Oaxaca, Mexico, a thousand miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border in Mixteco indigenous communities that have a long history of connection and ties to Walla Walla, Washington, where Whitman is located. And in Oaxaca, we're going to be studying the root causes of migration, why people make the dangerous journey north. Then we'll travel north to the U.S.-Mexico border and we'll spend 12 days on the U.S.-Mexico border talking to community leaders, activists, government officials, immigrant rights advocates, advocates and migrants um, about how the border came to be the way it is today and how it could be different. Then we'll head north again, this time to Washington state, where we'll finish off the trip talking to immigrant rights advocacy groups across the state about how we can take what we've learned on the program and put it into practice right here in our own communities. Anyway, that's in the planning for summer of 2021, and I hope that some of you uh, might even be part of that. The first thing we're gonna do when uh, Intro to Global Migration starts up again uh, next week is to really check in with each other and remember that commitment to mutual support and uh, intellectual excitement that we try to kindle in all of our classes. And then we're just gonna dive right into some really tough questions. Thus far in the course, we've been studying things like refugee law, uh, international refugee law, the economics of migration, uh, climate change and migration. Uh, when the semester got interrupted, we were in the middle of debating constitutional questions about the power of the president to close borders, uh, as well as the rights of undocumented people within the United States. As we're moving forward, uh, we're going to start with some really urgent new material. Maybe you've heard of Zyklon B. Maybe not by name, but it was the gas that was used to kill Jews that, and other people who were deemed human vermin uh, in the Nazi death camps. But did you know that Zyklon B was first used against humans on the U.S.-Mexico border? In fact, the historian David Dorado Romo, uh, who writes about this largely unknown history, uh, argues that the Nazis might have gotten the idea to use Zyklon B from seeing the example of U.S. border officials uh, in the 1930s. And the story begins with a typhus epidemic uh, and raging fears of typhus uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Typhus epidemics back then were a terrifying killer. Uh, there were outbreaks uh, all over the United States and around the world, uh, including in Mexico in 1915. Of course, the Mexican outbreak passed, like the outbreaks in the United States, but it really helped cement the idea in the American imagination that Mexicans were dirty and disease spreaders. And so in the Southwest, fears of typhus began to fixate on Mexican immigrants long after the Mexican typhus outbreak. And even though it was not clear at all that uh, rates of typhus at that point in Mexico were worse than in the United States, and much less that Mexican migrants brought the disease to the United States. In response to this perceived threat, border officials in the United States began subjecting Mexicans 
mostly Mexicans that they deemed subjectively to look poor or indigenous uh, to really brutal treatment at ports of entries. They stripped travelers naked, bathed them in gasoline or kerosene, and in 1929, uh, U.S. border officials began taking the clothing and possessions of Mexicans crossing the border and gassing it with a new chemical, Zyklon. Actually, a much uh, a stronger uh, mixture of Zyklon gas than would be used later in the concentration camps. And Zyklon gas is, is deadly when absorbed through the skin. Uh, and so Romo argues that this practice likely caused tens of thousands of deaths and cancers and births at birth defects um, that went unrecorded in history. We will never know how much harm those policies created, but we do know that this kind of story in which fear of disease gets pinned on a racial other in a way that turns out deadly is a recurring theme throughout the history of immigration policy in the United States. And it's had a major effect on shaping the way that immigration law looks even today. You may not have heard of Zyklon B, uh, but I'm sure that by this point, you've definitely heard of the Spanish flu epidemic that killed around 50 million people around the world in 1918. But you probably didn't know that the Spanish uh, flu originated uh, in Fort Riley, Kansas. It's, it's a bit of a story how a flu that began with U.S. soldiers in the Midwest eventually got the name the Spanish flu, uh, but one thing is clear. Associating that flu with Spain at that moment helped fan the flames of nativism. You see, at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, this was a time of massive immigration to the United States. Probably some of your ancestors came here during that period. And it wasn't just any immigration. It was the high point of immigration from Southern European countries like Spain and Italy and Eastern European countries like Russia and Poland. It brought people who were considered uh, by inferior, racially inferior, by followers of the eugenics movement, which was at the peak of its popularity in the United States in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. Um, it brought them to the United States. In 1924, nativists and eugenicists in Congress passed a, the sweeping National Origins Act um, that imposed massive uh, unprecedented limits on immigration to the United States. Immigration by people who were deemed not white was effectively banned completely, uh, and a new series of restrictive quotas made it almost impossible for people from Southern and Eastern uh, Europe uh, to immigrate to the United States. Lots of fears fed into this anti-immigrant moment, uh, but a strong and inaccurate association between supposedly dirty immigrants and disease played a significant role in passing that law and shaping that law. And that law would then become the foundation of the whole U.S. immigration system into the 1960s and really, uh, in significant way, still shapes aspects of our immigration law today. And here our story collides with Zyklon B again, uh, because it was that restrictive 1924 law that made it almost impossible for Jews fleeing the Nazis in the 30s and 40s to find refuge in the United States. But perhaps nowhere is this painful part of U.S. immigration history more evident than in policies and rhetoric that were directed at Asian immigrants. In fact, the first major immigration restrictions of any kind at all in the United States came in the 1870s and 1880s and were directed solely at Chinese immigrants. The final of that series of laws uh, was called the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, and it effectively banned all immigration by people of Chinese origin. 
Now, blatant racism uh, and fear of economic competition fueled those laws, um, but the rhetoric surrounding those laws often tried to link Chinese immigration and Chinese immigrants to outbreaks of disease like syphilis, smallpox, and even bubonic plague. And that racial scapegoating ended up, often ended up undermining public health in really serious ways. For example, the historian Nyan Shaw writes about a time in San Francisco history when authorities associated bubonic plague so directly with Chinese immigration that they went as far as to say that white people couldn't get the disease. In fact, the Surgeon General even declared that bubonic plague was a disease unique to rice eaters. Not surprisingly, focusing public health attention solely on Chinese people did not help stop the spread of disease, and it deepened anti-Chinese hatred and discrimination. So now, what are we to make of current efforts to paint COVID-19 as the Chinese virus? Sure, it originated in China, but what are the politics today of directing attention and blame towards China in our current moment? And what about Central American asylum seekers at the border? Will fear of foreign disease provide cover for the enactment of long dreamed of restrictions on asylum and elimination of due process in the deportation proceeding, in deportation proceedings um, that have nothing to do with public health? Already, we're starting to see glimmers of this age old pattern starting to repeat itself. Um, this pattern in which fear of disease, racism, and immigration restriction go hand in hand. So, when we get back to classes, students in Introduction to Global Migration will be reading about the history of disease and immigration law, and as an assignment, they'll be writing a letter to a family member or a friend telling them, uh, or answering the question, uh, what does the history of U.S. immigration policy have to teach us today about how we want to respond to this present-day crisis? How do we weigh the urgent need for public health measures right now with rightful suspicions of the ways in which even well-meaning public health measures often end up targeting vulnerable people for exclusion and dehumanization? So how would you answer that question? What would you write in your prompt? Let's talk about that next year in Introduction to Global Migration. Uh, and until then, stay well.